In the last segment, we talked about relations and ordered sets, and we'll now build on this by talking about functions and the cardinality or size of sets. So we'll start by defining functions and cardinality, then discuss a special class of sets called countable sets, and we'll end by proving two results. First, that the countable union of countable sets is itself countable, and second, that the set of n-tuples from a countable set is countable. Recall that in the last segment, we defined a relation from set A to set B as a subset of the Cartesian product of A and B, and we can define a function as a special type of relation as follows. We say that a function from A to B is a subset of the Cartesian product of A and B, which satisfies two properties. First, for every element of A, there exists some element of B, such that the ordered pair AB is in F, and second, that if the ordered pairs AB and AC are both in F, then B and C must be the same element. And if we drop the second requirement, we end up with a correspondence, and we'll discuss these later in the course. Now I'll quickly go through some definitions that will be familiar to most of you. If f is a function from a to b, a is called the domain and b the codomain of f. If the ordered pair a, b is in f, then we say that f of a is equal to b and call b the image of a under f. And if we have a subset x of the domain, then the image of x is the set of all points in b that are images for some point in x. The range of the function is just the image of the domain. And the inverse image of a subset y of the codomain is the set of points in the domain whose images lie in y. And the inverse image may or may not be a function. We'll get back to this point in a minute. Next, we consider a few special classes of functions. If the image of the domain is the codomain, then we say that f is a surjection or onto. And if distinct elements in the domain have distinct images, then we say that f is an injection or one-to-one. -one. And if f satisfies both these properties, it's called a bijection. And you should verify that the relation from B to A, defined as all points B A such that the ordered pair A B is in F, is a function if and only if F is a bijection. And if F is a bijection, we say that it's invertible, and we refer to the relation F inverse as the inverse function. Next, we're going to define a particular type of relation called an equivalence relation based on three properties. We say that a relation on a non-empty set A is reflexive if for every element A, the ordered pair A A is in the relation, we say that it's symmetric if for any pair of elements AB, if AB is in the relation, then so is BA. And we say that it's transitive if for every three elements ABC, if AB and BC are both in R, then so is AC. And a relation with all these properties is called an equivalence relation. And you should verify that an equivalence relation divides or partitions the set A into distinct equivalence classes, such that every element of A belongs to exactly one of these classes. Now we can use the notion of a bijection to think about the cardinality of the size of sets. So if there exists a bijection f from a to b, we say that the sets a and b can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence, or that they have the same cardinality, or that they're equivalent. And the notation is shown here on the slide. And you should verify that the property of having the same cardinality defines an equivalence relation. Now it's clear that finite sets can be equivalent if and only if they have the same number of elements. So a finite set can't be equivalent to any of its proper subsets. But that's not the case for infinite sets. We say that a set is countable if it's equivalent to the set of natural numbers. In other words, if there exists a bijection from the set of natural numbers to a set, we say that the set is countable. And if we have an infinite set that is neither finite nor countable, we call it uncountable. Now unlike finite sets, an infinite set can be equivalent to one of its proper subsets. And to construct an example of this, you should try to find a bijection from the set of integers to the set of natural numbers. Next, we consider sequences. So a sequence xn in a non-empty set x is just an ordered array of elements, each of which belongs to x. And you can think of a sequence as being a function from the set of natural numbers to the set x, where the image of the number n is just the nth term in the sequence. And we say that a sequence yn is a subsequence of xn if we remove some terms from xn, but leave the other terms in the order in which they originally appeared. Formally, yn is a subsequence of xn if there exists a strictly increasing function f from the set of natural numbers to itself, such that f of n tells you which term in the x sequence is the nth term in the y sequence. And the notation for a subsequence is shown on the slide. Now, since every countable set can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers, every such set can be viewed as the range of a sequence of distinct terms. And we say that the elements of a countable set can be arranged in a sequence. And you can easily verify that every infinite subset of a countable set must be countable, because it corresponds to a subsequence of the original sequence. Now we prove two quick results. First, that the countable union of countable sets is itself countable. 
So let En be a sequence of sets, each of which is countable. And let's define S as the union of these sets. Then the theorem states that S is itself a countable set. So let's prove this. Since each set EI is countable, we can arrange the terms of this set in a sequence, and we can arrange the sequences themselves as shown on the slide. So we arrange the sequences vertically and the terms in each sequence horizontally. Now we can construct a new sequence as follows. Let's start with x11, and then pick terms on the second diagonal, and then the third, and so on. Now the elements of S are all contained in this sequence, but some elements might appear multiple times. And you should verify that if we delete the repeated terms, so that every term in the sequence is unique, we still have an infinite number of terms, and therefore a subsequence. And so the elements of S correspond to the terms of a sequence, and S is therefore countable. And so we've proved that a countable union of countable sets is itself countable. Now to finish up, let's consider countable n-tuples from a set A. So what we mean by a countable n-tuple is simply a finite ordered array of terms, A1 to An, each of which is an element of A. And we let Bn denote the set of all such n-tuples. We want to prove that Bn is countable. Now we'll do this by induction. So first observe that B1 must be countable. B1 is just the set of one-tuples, and it's easy to construct a bijection from the set A to the set of one-tuples from A. Now suppose that Bn minus 1 is countable for some n. We want to show that this implies that Bn is countable. Now note that Bn is the set of all ordered pairs, Ba, where the first element is an n minus 1 tuple, and the last is an element of A. Now for any given B, the set of ordered pairs Ba is equivalent to A, for the same reason as B1 is equivalent to A, because we're holding the n minus 1 tuple constant and just varying the last element. Now you can see that Bn is countable, because the set of pairs Ba is countable for any given B, and to get Bn, we take the union of all such sets as B varies across Bn minus 1. And so from our earlier result, which states that a countable union of countable sets is countable, we deduce that Bn is countable, provided that Bn minus 1 is countable. Now combining this with the fact that B1 is countable, we conclude that Bn is countable. And we've proved the result we were after, which is that the set of all n-tuples from a countable set is itself countable. And an immediate consequence of this is that the set of rational numbers is countable. And that's because each rational number can be viewed as the ratio of two integers. The set of integers is countable, and so the set of rational numbers is equivalent to the set of n-tuples from the set of integers, where n is equal to 2. And we'll finish this segment with an example of an uncountable set, which is the set of all binary sequences. So a binary sequence is just a sequence in which every term is either 0 or 1. Let A denote the set of binary sequences, and let T denote a countable subset of A. And we'll show that there exists a sequence in A that isn't an element of T for any such T which implies that A can't be a countable subset of itself, and therefore A can't be countable. To see this, note that if T is a countable set of sequences, we can arrange these sequences as shown on the slide. Each element of T is a binary sequence, and we have a countable set of these. And we can now construct a new sequence S by switching the nth term of Sn from a 0 to a 1, or a 1 to a 0, as the case may be. And this new sequence clearly is not an element of T, and so therefore any countable subset of A is missing some sequence in A. This means that A can't be a countable subset of itself, and therefore A can't be countable. And so we've shown that the set of all binary sequences is an example of an uncountable set. And we'll stop there for this segment.